for, uh, for accepting our invitation to be on the training master series. Yeah, so I'm happy to do it. I've been, I've been to Shanghai several times. I've been to China several times. I've always enjoyed it. And I'm looking forward to being able to speak to the folks there. You bet, you bet. Thank you so much. And uh, the last time I, we met was a couple of three or four times, uh, four, uh, three or four years ago. Uh, you have been to China a couple of times. And uh, uh, I remember you went to um, Beijing Normal University. You went to Shanghai Foreign Studies University, uh, East, East China Normal University, and you gave out all the speeches and a couple of times. Yeah, and I that's what's been very Guangzhou. nice of you. Yeah, I've been to Guangzhou, Xi'an, and giving talks there as well. And I've loved every time I've been there. So I'm glad to be back, at least virtually. You bet, you bet. I, at least those, those are what I remember, some, some of them that I attended. I yes. don't know that you've been to Guangzhou and Xi'an as well. I, I'm so glad you know our country well. Uh -huh. uh, for, just for our audience, Bob, would you please uh, introduce yourself a little bit, tell us where you grew up, where you went to college, where you studied and where you work and live and work now? Sure, uh, I'm originally from New York City. As a matter of fact, the background you see here is in New York City. Uh, I went to college, undergraduate school in New York City, and then went to graduate school at Arizona State University in the Educational Technology Program. It was called Educational Technology at the time, although it was really about instructional design. I then got a job at Florida State University as a professor in the Instructional Design Program there. I thought I'd stay there three years. It's in Tallahassee, Florida, which is a small city compared to New York. And 40 some odd years later, I'm still there actually. Uh, I no longer teach, but I'm now the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Education there. And my responsibilities are to help our faculty do their research, find grant money to support their research. And I love my work. I love teaching for over 35 years and I've loved uh, the new job that I've had, which I've had now almost, uh, almost 10 years. So uh, uh, Florida State is where I am usually. Uh, I'm also up in New York a lot because my three children now have five children of their own. So my wife and I spend a lot of time up here with our children and grandchildren. Great, great. Oh, Florida State, you know, I interviewed a couple of them then. They're, they're your colleagues like uh, Dr. Roger Kaufman, uh, Professor Roger Kaufman, Professor uh, Bob, uh, uh, Bob. Uh, Branson, yes, uh, the a a ADDIC model, ADDIE model inventor, and also uh, Dr. John Keller, and also all these uh, great names, and also yourself. And uh, you have been working with some great names there. I mean, Florida State University is one of the epic centers of, in our field throughout yeah, the world. So, yeah, that's one of the reasons I stayed as long as I did. I came there. And I was uh, so excited to be with some of the biggest names. Robert Gagné was there, uh, Leslie Briggs, Walter Dick, who I'm still quite close with. Um, and plus the names you already mentioned, Bob Morgan was another one, Marcy Driscoll. Uh, I think Florida State, along with Indiana, was always considered the two top programs in the world, most likely, in instructional design. And it still remains a strong program today, although most of the people whose names we've mentioned now are retired. Right, right. But there are still, I mean, uh, it was those, uh, these big names that uh, laid the cornerstone for our field, for our profession. Mm -hmm. I agree. And you have been through that uh, yourself. You have lived in, in the, in, you have lived in the entire, through the entire history and you have made your own uh, contribution to the, to the field. And uh, you are history <laughs> to, to us because we're babies in, compared to you. And uh, I'm only like 52 and you're, uh, may I ask how old are you now? Yeah, 72. And you're still working? Yeah, and I intend to work for another 10 years because I enjoy it so much. Oh my God. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll, we'll try to beat in that record. <laughs> okay, okay. And uh, oh, at the different stages, uh, Bob, you, because you have been through, I mean, Florida State has been the epic center in our field and uh, made a great contribution, so many milestones in our profession. And uh, the field of instructional design technology has been, has different definitions, different names, but will you please tell us, we, we have seen different versions of the history of ISD, uh, instructional system design. Can you tell us your version or the brief history of the field. 
Sure. Um, <laughs> this is something you can do very quickly. Just, but I'll be, just, just be brief. Uh, sure. be sure. So you know, uh, in the in the nineteen forties, um, when the United States entered World War II, they needed to right. have a lot of uh, soldiers trained quickly. So some right. famous uh, educational psych uh, psychologists, such as Robert Gagne, Bob Bob Morgan, uh, Bob um, Mager, um, Leslie Briggs. Um, all got together in the military and used the principles of educational psychology to design training programs to train the military personnel how to do their jobs better. And as a matter of fact, there's a famous quote by a German general um, after the war was over, and he's most likely was exaggerating a little bit, but he said something to the effect that the main reason that Germany lost the war was because of the quick way the soldiers in the United States were trained. So we want to say that it was because of ISD that America won the war. Um, I read about that in one book. I forgot where I read it. My book. Uh, where I read my it. Book. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a your book? Yes. Thank you. That's true. That's true. Uh, I have a, a chapter, I have a book called Trends and Issues in Instructional Design and Technology, and it's in its fourth edition. And the second chapter in the book, it kind of goes over the history of our field. I'm going to give you a very, yeah, that's the third edition. No, that's actually an earlier edition. The second. The yeah, second. second. Yeah, and we already have the fourth edition. Matter of fact, I think the second or third was ch translated into Chinese, so people can get yes. the Chinese version of them. But we're now we're in the fourth edition, and there's still a chapter in there on the history of the field. And what I'm saying here, very, very briefly, is um, an abbreviated version of that. Um, after the war was over, uh, people got together and started developing things like behavioral objectives, figuring out how to do task analysis. Uh, how to design tests that were criterion reference, in other words, based on the objectives. And before you know it, you had a whole system for designing effective instruction. And first, um, companies in the 1970s started recognizing the value of using the systems approach to design their training. And they had excellent results. One specific example I can give you is uh, Bell Labs or AT&T, the American phone company, uh, which was trying to train linemen how to put up their, their power lines. And there were a lot of injuries on the job. And these men were spending, I think it was something like 40 hours a week, 40 hours total getting training. Instructional design specialists came in, looked at the training and said, a lot of this is superfluous. They don't need a lot of this. And they were able to reduce the training from 40 hours, I think to about eight or nine hours. And there was no decrease in the safety record of the employees. So that was just one of many examples of how business and industry saw the value of ISD. And it's grown since then. And the job opportunities for people in business and industry, instructional designers in business and industry in the United States is, is very great. When does the, when did instructional design came into, what exact year came into the business world, the corporate America? It, I don't think you can say a particular year. I think it was starting right. in the 1970s, late 1970s, that companies like Bell Labs, AT&T, right. Motorola, Arthur Anderson, the big accounting firm, started recognizing the value of hiring instructional designers. And ever since then, uh, the, that, that particular domain is where a lot of instructional designers work. Of course, others work in edu education, higher education. Now in higher education, there's many opportunities because with online instruction, instructors who normally teach face-to-face -face are not very good at, or not at all familiar with designing online instruction. So rather than just telling them, go ahead and put your course online, they usually teamed up with an instructional designer who helps them design good online instruction. So uh, in the 70s, the uh, corporate in America started to borrow all these uh, uh, theories and models and uh, 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 theories and model methodologies from uh, the educational field, uh, from academia for their own uh, benefits. And ever since it never stopped. That's correct. So it didn't start, it didn't start from day one, like right, right after World War II. And no, no, it, like I say, at first it was used to design military training. Uh, then it started being used in higher education. Fact, when I first came to Florida State, my job wasn't just to be a professor, but also to work with faculty members to improve the quality of their instruction. So it was in academia that our students were first getting positions. And then it branched out from there to business and industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, ISD, uh, Instructional System Design, has been developing so many years. 
there are, there have been debates, you know, how ISD is, you know, useful. Is it too linear, too lengthy or clumsy or uh, too um, energy taking? Um, so what's your view of that? Do you think, my, my, my extended question is, do you think, I, what's the future of ISD? Is, is, is it gonna disappear? Is it gonna be merged? Is it gonna be changed to another, to another name or something like that? Yeah, I don't think the name is as important as the basic concepts of instructional systems design. You know, uh, you see all these complex models and eight, 10 step models. Uh, first of all, they're usually not done in a linear fashion. I've been doing instructional design for 40 years. And even though it looks linear on paper, you can start almost anywhere in the process. You can, you can look and see, what is this person teaching? Then you go back in and ask him, you know, what are your real, what are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish? You work backwards from there, figure out what their goals are. Then you just revise the instruction to make it simpler. So it's not a linear process. I think um, the future of instructional design is, well, let me go back a moment. But the basic elements of instructional design, from my perspective, are just basically four. Uh, you want to be clear about what it is you want your students to learn. What are the, what's the knowledge and skills that you mm -hmm. want your students to acquire? This is whether you're talking about right. students in public schools and higher education or people in the training environment. What, is, what are the skills and what is the knowledge that I want these people to acquire? Once you're clear about that, what you want to do is look at your instruction and say, does this instruction really teach them the, those things? Or is it dealing with issues that are tangential? So if I'm trying to teach somebody how to perform a particular task, do I really need to teach him or her about the history behind this task? No, what you need to teach them is how to perform the task. You need to give them the rules necessary to perform it. You have to have them practice that behavior. You show them how to do it. And so it's a rules, an example, have them practice it, give them feedback. And that's what's essential, making sure that the instruction provides people with the information and the practice and feedback they need to perform those skills that you want them to acquire. The third, that's the second step, making sure the instruction matches your goals right. or objectives. The third right. step, from my perspective, is assessing learners. That doesn't mean a paper and pencil test, but looking to see whether the learners can actually perform the skills that you've taught mm -hmm. them. This is the goal to get them to perform the skills. Now, if they can't perform the skills, typically what most people, most teachers, trainers will say is, boy, these are slow learners. They don't know how to do things. But the fact is, you haven't done a good job of teaching them those things. So that comes to the fourth step. You assess them to see whether they can do it, step number three. If they can't do it, what you need to do is go back and revise your training to make sure it's now, it enables them to do it. Maybe they don't have the prerequisite skills necessary, in which case you need to provide them with those skills before you have them learn this stuff. So it's basically, from my perspective, a four-step process. What are the objectives or goals? Make sure the instruction matches those goals or objectives. Matches means teaches them what they're supposed to teach, learn. Assess mm -hmm. them to see whether they've learned it. And if they haven't learned it, revise your instruction until they can perform those skills. We have seen many definitions. Thank you so much for the four, uh, four steps. These four steps, I think they are very common and they're kind of a generalized and they cover all of the four essential points of uh, all the ISD models. Uh, ISD has many definitions like Bob, uh, Bob Gane, uh, David Camp, and everybody has their own uh, definition of ISD. But, um, but right now, well, in your book, uh, the trends and issues in instructional design technology prefer to call instructional system design, in, uh, instead of ISD, we call it IDT. The yeah, I can talk about that. Yeah, can you talk, uh, tell us about that, why? Yeah, you know, the history of our field, um, even before Gagne and World War II, uh, many people were involved in using media, things like right. film, television, and so on, to help improve the quality of, the, of instruction. So back in the early 1900s in the United States, up through the 1950s and 60s, the field was called educational technology or instructional technology. And it basically oh, involved okay. the use of media, various media, first film, then radio, then television, to help people learn. Then as Gagne and others started bringing in uh, ideas from psychology into the field, they said, hey, it's not just a matter of the media, but it's the instruction that's delivered via the media 
that makes a difference. And that instruction should be systematically designed. That's where we get a term like instructional systems design or instructional design. So we now see a merging of two fields. We see the media people who want to design instruction primarily via media and haven't been, at least in the past, all that concerned about carefully designing the instruction. And then you see people who have a background in educational psychology saying, we need to be very concerned about the quality of the instruction and there's a systematic process for designing this instruction. So you have two different groups of people kind of coming together, the media people, or what we might call the instructional technology people, and you have the instructional design people. And starting in the late 60s, 70s, uh, these two groups started working together more and, and merging their interests. So some people continue to call the field educational technology. I know that's a common term in uh, academic programs in China that teach our uh, students about instructional design. But the problem with the term like educational technology is when you use that term, people immediately think of media. Now, you know, mm. it could be online instruction, uh, could be virtual reality. And, and that's not, doesn't really capture the full nature of what I feel about. It's not just about media. It's about the quality of the instruction that's presented via that media. So I felt that the term instructional technology was not adequate because it focused, or educational technology, because it focused too heavily on media. And if we simply use the term ISD, instructional system design, or instructional design, we're sort of ignoring the media side of the field. So when you use a term like instructional design and technology, you're capturing both the media side of the field as well as the instructional design side of the field. Now, uh, I don't want to get full credit for coming up with that term. Back in the uh, 70s, or might, might have been more like 1980, uh, many people in our field who were teaching ISD and media decided to get together a group of professors of those two areas. And they called that group Professors of Instructional Design and Technology. So they were the first ones to use that term. Uh, it wasn't all that popular except among those people who were in that group. And I decided, let's use that term as the name for the field. And that's what I use in my book. I see some programs now using that term, but the, you know, regardless of the term that you use, what you need to think about if you're in our field is, I'm gonna carefully and systematically design instruction. And I will use most likely some media it, to present that instruction. So is a perfect hybrid or perfect combination to take care of the first of the media trend, the media focus, and then the educational psychology, educational psychology focus. Yes, and I, it's combined. I, yes, that's correct. And communications comes in there as well, but we won't make things any more complicated than they are already. But uh, yes. Yeah, it, it, it covers uh, the term ISD or the IDT. I mean, the term ISD itself and the IDT covers a wide range. There's so many facets and so many things and topics, wide range of topics in in uh, in, uh, in in his, in his own field i mean media and uh, the pedagogies there's so many ways of delivery and uh, i mean there are different chunks it's, it's such a complicated study yes, and, uh, areas nobody, of study yeah. and people have different ideas about how to systematically design instruction um, different right. people have expertise with regard to different technologies and in my book which is kind of an overview of the field we have chapters on many of these different approaches to instructional design right. and many of the new trends in the field. So uh, um, I try to keep up with that. And every four or five years, we had to update the book because as new technologies come along, as new thoughts about how to design instruction come along, we had to add new chapters, get rid of some of the old chapters. And I've really enjoyed doing this over the four editions. <laughs> Whether I have another edition in me, I don't know. But uh, I've certainly enjoyed The most recent edition was published in early 2018. Uh, yeah. um, so I don't know if I have another edition that I want to work on, but the field is changing rapidly. The, the key point though is regardless of the media that you use to present right. the instruction, if the instruction is not carefully designed and well presented, it's not going to be effective. So underlying all of this, in my opinion, is careful design of instruction, what you might call ISD, instructional systems design. Yeah, uh, David Merrill in your book uh, also mentioned in the in the Dave Merrill. Yes, you know, and uh, he he also mentioned uh, uh, that he cited what uh, Dick Clark said. As a matter of fact, I interviewed Dick Clark uh, uh, a couple couple uh, two months ago, and uh, he he told me that 
media, he was very big. I mean, he was, was very much into media as well, or, or his, his early stages. And he said, media is like the truck. He used the metaphor. It's like a grocery, grocery store. Media is like the truck. But it do, doesn't matter what the truck is, but the nutrition that the truck carries matters. You know, that's yeah. what human body needs. Yeah, it, it's the food that's in the truck that makes the difference. It's not the delivery system that makes the difference. And I, I sort of agree with Clark, but I have a little bit of different perspective. Clark said it, you can use any medium uh, or to deliver the good instruction, but that isn't necessarily true. Think, if we want to continue the analogy, think about food that needs to be kept cold. You need a particular type oh, yeah. of truck, a refrigerated truck to deliver yeah. that, that content. In the same way, depending on the nature of the content, different media will work better than other media. You take some uh, vegetables that need to be kept refrigerated and you deliver it in a truck that's not refrigerated, the instruction's not gonna work well. The, the vegetables are gonna get spoiled. So yes, it's the content that's important, but we also need to think about what medium would be best to deliver that, uh, that nutrition. And of course, in between, there are also cost and benefit ratio in, yes. com comes in between. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely. We, you, you know, people have a tendency to just jump on the media bandwagon. This has been, I have a whole section of my chapter on the history of the field where I talk about how as each new medium came along, everybody said, I want to use film. I want to use radio. I want to use television without carefully thinking about whether that medium was really needed to deliver the instruction. That really uh, merged into, naturally falls into our next question. And uh, in the future, right now, Cell phones, I mean, smartphones, everybody is, has a media center. I mean, is, this is a media center. So in the future, uh, with, you know, instruction system design, our field started very big on medium at the very beginning. And now, and, and, the, and the, in, the, in the middle, a couple of like decades, and then we combine education and psychology, education and psychology with the medium. And now the medium, come back again, come back again. Now, even with AI is never happened before in human history. So what do you think will define our field in the future? Will, will the technology define it or the education, education and psychology of its own will define or I mean, continue. I, I, unfortunately, it. well, I don't know if it's unfortunate or fortunate, you know, tools like a cell phone now enable us to present information, instruction, in a wide variety of different ways. It's not like, oh, you only have print or you only have access to film. You can, ha you can have access to all of these different delivery systems via something as simple as a phone. So media are playing a very big role in where our field is going. I'm a little concerned that people get, get so caught up with the media that they forget about the nature of the instruction that needs to be presented via that medium. And I, I think I see, unfortunately, from my perspective, in the programs in America that teach instructional design, that teach uh, instructional technology or instructional design and technology, much more emphasis on the medium and much less emphasis on carefully designing the instruction uh, that's to be delivered by that medium. So, you know, this, th these, new, these new technology tools provide us with great opportunities, but if we don't carefully design the instruction that's gonna be de delivered via those media, I think we're, we're not heading in the right direction. On, one other thing I'll mention though, having tools that enable us to inter, uh, access the internet and to gather information so easily, so quickly, uh, also changes the nature of what our profession's about. Because now it isn't always the case that some expert has to deliver the instruction. Now many people can go online and find the information they need without having some expert, like me, so-called so expert, uh, give them that information. Oh, you are. <laughs> okay, well in any case, so, you know, the, the, the nature of what we need to deliver in, is, by uh, instruction has changed because a lot of the information that we used to have to deliver to, to people because they couldn't get elsewhere, they can now easily access uh, via the various tools that are available to them. Uh, two, two more questions, uh, just branch question. Do you, uh, I totally agree that, um, you know, uh, I totally agree with you that it, it shouldn't take, medium should not take over whatever should be delivered. So in the, uh, we have another saying called content is king. You've probably <laughs> heard of that many times. Do you, do you agree with that? Oh, content is king. I guess that's true. The, it's the information 
that's being delivered that's crucial. But that content better be the appropriate content. I, I too often see, and I've observed lots of people, uh, younger faculty, I go into classrooms and observe them teaching. And I think one of the big problems is we go off on tangents. You know, one of the things about ISD that's important, and this is, I think, an analogy I like to use is, it, it's like a roadmap. It tell, you, you, you know where you want to end up. Mm -hmm. And when you have ISD, when you're using instructional systems design, you have developed a route to get to where you want to go. Oftentimes, people have a goal in mind, but they start heading down the road, and before you know it, oh, there's a little turn here. I'm going to go in this direction. Oh, there's another turn here. I'm going, and before you know it, they're way off track. They're way off track, and they never get back on track, and they don't get to the goal they want to get to. ISD, and some people criticize ISD because they say it's too linear. It's too focused. I have no problem going off on a tangent if the tangent is something that might be of interest to my students. But because I have a clear goal in mind, I eventually get back on the right path and go towards the destination. So I think content is king, but we got to make sure it's the right content that we're, that we're following the roadmap and not going too far afield and not teaching our students the skills and knowledge they need to have. You bet, you bet. Uh, thank you for clarification. And uh, because that's a lot of people say here in China, and we do attach great importance to content. Well, not in the past, but now in the, uh, in the recent past years, and then uh, corporate universities have been flourishing in China. They're growing so fast. Corporate universities is not very big in, in America anymore, but in China, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it evolves in, in another format. So, but the name of corporate university is so popular. Uh, but at the very beginning, tw about 20 years ago, in the 20s, uh, I mean, in the year 2000, when I came, started to come back to China and visit here and there, but th at that time, we focused, like, like America, we focused so much on media. You know, at that time, oh, we have this LMS, we have that LMS, we need to have platform, we need to install a system, but, uh-huh, what, what do we have? And then we don't have, at that time, we don't have content. But 20 years later, right now, we're way better than the very beginning. At that time, we wasted a lot of energy, we paid a lot of tuition and price for that kind of thinking. But right now, we have, uh, we, we come back to the, to, we, we come to, we come, we come to the point to realize that content is king. Content is very important, but we yes. do also need to make perfect combination of the content and the delivery methods because they go with each other. Yes. Now, when we talk about content, about the instruction that's going to be presented to our learners, we have to be careful that it isn't just delivery of information. It isn't just someone presenting, giving a lecture to our to their students to their learners we have to be sure that there's lots of interaction that the learners are succinctly informed as to the key information they need to know then giving them then showing them ex if it's a skill showing them examples of how to perform that skill giving them lots of practice and providing them with feedback to make sure they've acquired those skills too often we have or at least we used to have the talking head phenomenon where regardless of the medium, somebody like me, you see my talking head right now, get, <laughs> this is a different situation. We're not trying to teach skills. We're just having a conversation. But too often you right. see instruction, be it online or face-to-face, -face, a faculty member, a subject matter expert, just talking to the learners and not giving them the opportunity to actually practice the skills or the knowledge they need to acquire and not providing them with adequate feedback to let them know whether they've acquired those skills. So yes, content is important, but let's make sure that's well-designed content, not simply delivery of information. Absolutely, absolutely. And have you, my, uh, I want to uh, have another question. Do you, do you, have you, you have been many, many countries, especially in the developing countries, I just uh, described to you the earlier phenomenon in China. Have you seen that in other developing countries? Like earlier stages is focused on media now and then the- Yeah, I, th I think that's the case in quite a, quite a few. I've been to well, a lot of countries in East Asia. I think that was true in Japan and certainly in Korea as well. But I think in, in those two countries, and I know less about I, what you just described in China, I think now there's a greater emphasis, and at least in the programs I'm familiar with, the academic programs I'm familiar with, on teaching ISD and not focusing as much on the media, focusing on careful delivery of instruction rather than simply on use this new tool. Absolutely. Uh, so far as I know, Japan and Korea, 
they are very advanced in this field, um, at, at least leading us. I mean, they started early than, 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 than we did. I mean, than China did. And they're very mature in this as, a, you know, as, as developed countries. They're developed countries now, but they're very good, advanced. But, you know, th that leads to my next question. Uh, there are so many, right now, you know, there are instructional design programs and certification programs like I teach one, uh, the CID, a certified instructional designer in, in China and we give uh, ISPI certifications. It's an official ISPI certification, accreditation. So a lot of people want to be instructional designer, but there's no such a title in China called instructional designer yet. So my question to you, what do you think make a good instructional designer? You have been instructional designer for, 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 for ages. So yes. tell us your experience, please. Um, you know, I'm, I'm proud to say, by the way, that um, I try to practice what I preach. I'm going a little bit of a tangent now. I'm gonna get back on track on it. Um, at Florida State University, I was teaching students instructional design and I made sure that the principles I've described to you and to the audience here today were ones I used in my own courses. I always was very clear about my objectives. I made sure the students practiced the skills they, they, I was trying to get them to acquire, gave them lots of feedback. And uh, as a result of that, in the year 2000, I won the highest award offered at Florida State, given to just one faculty member who over the course of his career had done an outstanding job of teaching his students. The students nominated me and I won this award, the University Distinguished Teaching Professor Award. So I really was practicing what I was preaching. Um, I think, what, what are the, so from my perspective, to be a good instructor, to to do a good job of instruction, be a good instructional designer. You need to follow a systematic model, but you also need to be creative. It's not just rote. It isn't just, okay, mm -hmm. here's the objectives. Here's the things I need to teach them. Let me do that. You need to be creative, create interest. John Keller, whose big area is motivation, talks a lot about right. it. We right. need to come up with activities that are going to engage our learners, that they will enjoy, uh, that will make them want to learn. Uh, my goal wasn't just to have our stu my students acquire the skills they needed to acquire, but also yeah. have them enjoy the learning experience. George, I'm gonna send you, subsequent to our talk, a um, set of slides that I, I've given for now almost 20 years. When I won that award that I just spoke of, they asked me to give a lecture, a homecoming lecture at Florida State, where I described the techniques that I used that enabled me to win the award. I have a very nice set of slides um, unfortunately, I don't have a video version of this, but I at least I have the slides that describe how I, what I, how I went about planning my instruction and how I went about teaching it. And you'll see in those slides that it wasn't all about just get, get delivering the content. It was getting my students right. engaged, getting them to enjoy it. The number one mm -hmm. comment I would get from students when they filled out evaluation forms, my teacher was, he's so enthusiastic. He wants to get, he gets me enthusiastic about kind of, so a good instructional designer follows a systematic design process, doesn't get mm -hmm. too caught up in the medium, the media, wants to use the right media, but doesn't get, get carried away with media. And, imp and particularly important is creative, does creative things to help his students want to learn, to motivate his students. Those are the key elements to being a good instructional designer from my perspective. Thank you, thank you, because that's what uh, a lot of young professionals, learning development professionals aspire to be in the future. And the purpose of this interview to uh, help them see uh, the forerunners and also set up models that uh, what type of, or even standards, <laughs> behavioral standards in the future uh, in, in their career. So thank you for answering that question because, uh, because never ask anybody, any master thinkers, any gurus before, but this is the first time that I, that I, I ask. And, you don't have to uh, ask anybody else because I gave you the perfect answer. <laughs> I, hope every, I hope everybody realizes I'm just kidding. <laughs> You're kidding, but that's a very good answer. Thank you. And uh, uh, I, I hope that uh, we are going to have a lot of uh, qualified instructional designers because I, I taught ATD, uh, instructional design, design and learning certificate program for six, five or six years. And then I stopped teaching that. I started to teach CID. And I see every time I see the, you know, the glowing eyes and they, the, 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 uh, the aspiration they, that they, they have from within that they want to be an instructional designer. 
and uh, because in China it is totally new. Nobody knows about instructional system design. They think, oh, of course, it's just creating a pile of you know PPT slides, and then you teach. <laughs> and then, yeah. oh, today is Friday. Oh, next Monday we're going to have a course. So uh, I, 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 yeah, so John and Jay, and then and make me a course next Monday. I'm going to use it. <laughs> But that happens in America too. It used to happen a lot more in America. You know, somebody who was good in his or her job was put in the training department because he or she could do the job well. That didn't mean they could deliver instruction or design instruction well. And oftentimes they just end up telling war stories and not right. designing good instruction. That's why instructional design programs that teach students these skills are very important. I'm glad that training programs of that nature are now being created in China. And of course, some students in China might want to come to the States and study in some of the major programs in America, such as at Florida State, Indiana, Georgia, Penn State. I could go on and name 10 of these programs. Exactly, exactly. I was one of them, you know. Yeah. You, went, went to, you went to Indiana, right? Is that right, George? No, I went to, I went to uh, St. Cloud State in Minnesota. Oh, yes. I, I remember, was it Denny? Who was the fellow there? Uh, yeah, Den, Denny Fields. Yes, a wonderful guy, wonderful guy. Yep, and it's just my advisor. Yeah, he, he passed away, I think, unfortunately. He uh, passed away about five or six years ago. I met Denny at this, remember I mentioned earlier in our talk, this Professors of Instructional Design and Technology get together that we had starting in about right. 1980. And I met Denny there and we interacted for many years, a wonderful person. And he produced a yeah. really good student in George Group. Uh, thank you, thank you. Next time, beer on me. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, in, in your book, you have you, you offered many good advices to for pe for young people to getting instructional design positions. And uh, right now, there's not such a market yet, but I'm I'm sure I'm so sure that in in very short period of time there will be a boom in the instructional designer market. So what advice? You have 18, 18, <laughs> 18 advices, but you don't have to list all of them, but just uh, give us a few. You think the most applicable, most important. Yeah, um, so there's a chapter in my book and it's in all four editions called right. Getting a Job as an Instructional Designer. And what it basically does is it goes over my history of how I went from being a graduate student to a faculty member, how I got that position. And I oftentimes, <laughs> it's so nice because every so often, a couple of times a year, uh, somebody who I've never met before will send me an email saying, oh, Dr. Risa, I read your book and that chapter was my favorite chapter, getting a job as an instructional designer. So uh, your students might want to look at it. And uh, as you mentioned, George, in the edition you have, there's 18, but in the most recent edition, there's 20 lessons that I list that I learned. Uh, that I thought were helpful in my getting a job. And I did pick out about eight of them. I'm just gonna mention them briefly. Um, one is that most instructional design jobs today are in business and industry. Um, that's good, that's good, because there's a lot of opportunities there for, right. for people who wanna learn instructional design. Uh, so if it is, if the jobs are in business and industry, in addition to learning instructional design skills, it would be good for students to understand how businesses operate. You know, so taking a course, a basic course in business to understand how businesses operate. So when people in the organization are using some business terms, you can be familiar with them and be able to talk with them about those terms. Um, you need a, this is, I've been emphasizing this throughout our talk, is you need a strong set of design skills. You can't just be a media person or you can't just be a person who knows the content. You need to learn to do instructional design. So getting involved in some certificate program that will give you those skills, getting into an academic program that will give you those skills is essential if you're going to be successful as an instructional designer. You need to have strong communication skills because as an instructional designer, you need to express your ideas clearly, both in writing, uh, orally, and also be a really good listener because one of the key jobs of an instructional designer is to work with people who are subject matter experts and find out from them how uh, they do the job and then translate that into language that could be understood by people who are first learning the job. So you go into a setting, uh, somebody's an expert plumber, uh, he starts explaining to you how he does his job. You need to really carefully listen and ask lots of questions. Say, well, could you go over that again? I quite didn't understand it. Or I think you meant this by what you just said. So you wanna be very good at listening, taking notes, and then translating what they've said into simple language that can be presented quickly and concisely along with practice and feedback to your learners. So 
being a good, com having good communication skills is essential. Um, I think becoming active in a professional organization, and I know there are several there in China that are, in, that are organ, George, can you mention a couple of professional organizations that are in our field that are in China, or either like a AECT China or something of that nature? Well, there are, uh, there are, uh, well, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, there are, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the name, there are some branches of organizations and there are so many uh, professional organizations in China. There are some of the uh, mirrored, mirrored uh, branches here in China as well, like AECT, I'm sure, uh, like uh, ISBI, like uh, ATD, they have their own office there here they have three offices here on this three only three overseas office here and guess where they are they are in all in china uh -huh. and uh and uh of course a a a ahrd they have uh, organization here they had their annual meetings here yeah they're well i think i think the people who are listening to our conversation here should become familiar with or become aware of a couple of these professional mm -hmm. organizations and join one of them there's a lot of reasons for doing that one is when you go to the annual meetings of these organizations, you learn some new skills, you find out about the latest happenings in the field. Another one is just for networking purposes, getting to know other people exactly. in the profession, interacting with them, finding out what they are doing, uh, finding out about job opportunities. And when you get involved in a professional organization, and this really helped me in my career, if you volunteer to do some work in the organization, like you go to one of the business meetings, they say, oh, we really need someone to help out with this awards program. Volunteering to do that is so crucial because when you volunteer to do something and you do a good job at it, people start saying, oh, that Bob Reeser, he, he really does a good job at, uh, uh, with that awards program. Maybe um, if he needs a letter of support when he's applying for a job or he's going for a promotion, I'll be glad to write one for him. Or Bob's looking for another position. Of course, I never did in my career. I stuck with the same position I had. But uh, so joining a professional organization to learn new skills, to find out what the latest developments in the field are, and to create a network of support people who can help you in your career is essential. So, so get involved in a professional organization within our field and become active in that organization. Also, uh, and this is the last one I'll mention, if, look for good jobs that you think you'll be interested in and apply for the job even if it doesn't quite meet the skill set you have. So let's say you studied instructional design, as I hope many of you will, and you become really good at instructional design, and then you see an announcement for a position, uh, instructional designer with experience in AI needed for this position. And you say, well, I don't really have that AI experience, but I'm really good at instructional design. Don't be hesitant to apply. If you apply mm -hmm. for the job and people see on your resume or when they interview you, this guy is really, or this woman is really good at instructions, like, they're gonna put that other requirement aside and hire you. That's exactly what happened to me at Florida State. They, they wanted somebody who had a lot of media expertise. And frankly, I didn't have nearly as much media expertise as some other people did. But I applied for the job, they saw my resume, when they interviewed me, they saw, well, this guy has something. You see, this guy has something going for him. I don't know what they saw, but I had, must have had something. And they ended up hiring me. So even though I didn't have that set of skills, quite the same set of skills they called for, I had some of them, and I was particularly good in those areas, and they hired me. So don't be reluctant to apply for a job that's a little beyond your reach. If you have some key skills, they may hire you for the position. Great. Thank you. I really wish, Bob, I really wish that you had written this 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, so that I can use it. But sure. I uh, blindly uh, run into some, so I did something right, probably. So I, I can be an example of all the points that you, you, you made. And uh, building a network, uh, being in that circle is so important. You can, get, you can learn a lot, you can know a lot of people, and get a lot of more, way more opportunities than, than those who do not join the professional yes. organization. I agree, George, and I'm glad that's worked out so well for you. You know, that chapter in my book uh, is also an example of something I said earlier. I list out uh -huh. 20 lessons, but I do it in a very, as many people have said to me, in a very lighthearted, humorous way, poking fun at myself no. a lot of the time. So I, I'd like to encourage the people who are, who are uh, uh, listening to us today to read that chapter. You don't have to buy the book. Find the chapter online somewhere. <laughs> I'm sure it's available. And you'll really enjoy reading it besides learning a lot more than the lessons than the ones I just outlined today. I did. I did. I really like your, your, uh, your and your buddy, uh, your co-author, John, 
Dumpsey. Uh, he's, uh, you're both writing styles are so good. I really yeah. like it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is his na last name Dung, uh, Dung, uh, John Dumpsey? Yeah, yeah. He goes by Jack. His official name is John. His, his uh, birth name is John, but he goes by Jack, Jack Dempsey. Jack was a student of mine at Florida State University, uh, then got a job uh, in a program like Flo the one at Florida State in Alabama. And we right. decided to get together and do the book. And here it is <laughs> four editions later. John, uh, Jack retired recently, but I'm sticking it with it. I'm going to. So the student already retired, but the teacher is still teaching. That's right. Well, he, he happened to be one of the older students. I'm a little older than Jack is, <laughs> but he was only a couple of years younger than me. Jack, if you're listening to this, I uh, hope you're not uh, mad that I'm revealing your age. <laughs> anyway, uh, I just want to make up a point earlier that you said, uh, you know, it's one of the difficult things for instructional design in our profession to teach is that we're teaching, we have to walk the talk, you know, because we're teaching our students in terms of design, so our courses has to be instructionally sound. Exactly right. And I, I was always adamant about that. And, uh, you know, one of, uh, an example of that so I, was that my wife would often say to me, Bob, why are you up so late? You're, you're working on a course that you've taught for 35 years now. And I said, to, you know, I can always make it better. I'm going to try to redesign certain aspects of it to improve it. So I really wow. tried very hard to practice what I, what I was teaching. And I, I feel very good about having been successful at doing that. And I think that award that I won is an example of that. And again, I'll share those slides with you, George. Thank you, thank you. I, I look forward to it. Really, when we teach that instructional design classes, we're te really teaching cor a course within courses, you know, a course within a course. Yes, right, yes, by, sh by showing people how to do it. You're demonstrating what it is you exactly. want them to be able to do, yes. So you mentioned just now uh, some organizations. Tell, can you tell us your own, your own involvement with ACT, IBST, 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 PI, ISPI, and, and other organizations? Yes, so the main, uh, there, there were three organizations in my career that I've been actively involved in. The main one is AECT, the Association for Educational Communications and Technology. And by the way, they've had, as George mentioned, um, uh, conferences over there in Shanghai they've had a couple of conferences um, and they continue to I think they have offices over there as well uh, in AECT um, there's a whole division that's with for instructional design it's called division of design and development I think now the name is slightly different but in any case uh, back in the 70s when I was a graduate student at Arizona State uh, my professors encouraged me to go to that organization's meetings I gave a couple of papers I actually attended a couple of business meetings. What I told you to do is what I actually did. I started getting involved in helping uh, uh, do some of the business of the organization. I volunteered to re run the awards program for the organization. I got on mm -hmm. the E&D board and I started to know many, many more people in the field. And now I've been involved in that organization for 40 years. And actually two years ago, I won the Distinguished Service Award for that organization. Congrats. Having been involved for with it for so many years. So that was really a very key factor in my success in my career. Uh, the other two organizations that I have belonged to is IBSTIPI, which is the International Board of Standards for Training, Performance and Instruction. I think I've stated that correctly. Uh, they put together, and it's, it's a very small organization. George, were you, were you a member of the IBSTIPI board at some point? I don't recall. Yes, I was. I was between 2011 to 2017 for six yeah. years, two terms. Yes, I was on it for two terms as well, a little earlier than that. I think it was in the early right. 2000s. And this uh, organization updates standards for the field, publishes standards for the field. It's a small group, but I think their impact has been pretty great through the books that they've published. So I was active in that organization for about six years. And the third organization, one that isn't so much about instructional design, but more about research, is the American Educational Research Association, AERA. Uh, they have a division or a special interest group on instructional technology, and I've been very much involved with that organization as well. Uh, another popular organization, which I haven't been that involved with, um, is ISPI, International Society for Performance Improvement. And a lot of the speakers who George has, in, has interviewed have been members of that organization. Uh, ISPI is very important historically as well as today because what they emphasized 
was the notion of it's not just about people learning the skills, but being able to perform those skills on the job. So it's one thing for me to tell you, oh, the five steps necessary to perform this task are A, B, C, D, and E. But then you got to turn to Bob and say, Bob, can you actually do those things? Can you actually do A, B? Can you perform those skills? And it was the people in ISPI, the International Society for Performance Improvement, who emphasized the notion that, yes, we want our students to learn, but not just to learn things or to recite them, but to actually be able to perform the skills that, that are needed to do the job they've been, they've been tasked to do. So ISPI is another very good organization to be involved with. And I, George, I, I know you're very active in that organization. You've been on the board right. there, right? Right, I'm uh, still a board member, second term now. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Bob. Mm -hmm. uh, my next question is, my next question is combined uh, question uh, that uh, there, you know, you're, you have many mentors, influential figures in your career development, in your own career development. And uh, as I mentioned earlier before that, at FSU, you worked with some of the big names. Can you tell us your interactions with them? So share with us some of the big stories, which one that, uh, the one that especially I want to hear about, and I want our audience to hear about those big figures and your, your interactions with them because we really see something good and nice from those stories. Sure. Um, you know, we've mentioned a lot of people at Florida State who are, who are major figures in the field. I'm going I'm to focus on two, uh, Walter Dick and Robert Gagné. Um, I'm going to tell you a story first about Walter Dick. Um, Walt and I were colleagues. For, he was the person who created one of the key models, instructional design models called the Dick and Carry model of instructional design. And when I came to Florida State, Walt had already been there. He's about 10 years my senior. He's still doing uh, very by, well. By the way, I want to interrupt. Uh, the Walter Dick is uh, the author of my textbook. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. The Dick and Carry model, you know, the big yes. the system. Yes. I think they're in the seventh or eighth edition of that book right now. Seventh, uh, well, seventh or eighth now. Right. Yeah. So Walt and I worked together very closely at Florida State. Uh, we wrote two textbooks together. It was instructional design books designed for teachers in public schools. We wrote many articles, did a lot of research together. And after Walt retired, he retired first to Pennsylvania. And um, one day I was driving with my son, who had been in college in Michigan, to New York, um, where my son was going to be moving. And as we were on the highway, I saw a sign that said Brookville which happened to be the small town that Walt lived in. And um, I said to my son, let's surprise Walt. Let's, let's find where he lives and we'll go visit him in Brookville. So we got off the highway and I pulled up to this uh, store and got out and thought, maybe somebody in here can tell me where Walt Dick lives, I could ask him. So I went into the store and I asked the man, uh, do you know a Walter Dick? Uh, I'm trying to find him. And the man said, see, you see where your truck is parked? I was in a truck. He said, that, you're parked right in front of a park that was named after Walter Dick's father, who was the first doctor in our city. So that in itself was an amazing <laughs> coincidence. And he said, sure, I know exactly where Walt lives. So he gave me the address. My son and I drove to Walt's house, rang the bell, and Walt uh, came to the door and was shocked to see me and my son there, but he was so delighted and he came in and uh, gave me a big, I came in and gave me a big hug. We sat around and talked for a couple of hours. And then my son and I left and went to New York City. And when we got to New York City, I called my wife to tell her I arrived and she said, Bob, I have some sad news for you. Uh, uh, Robert Gagné, Bob Gagné, just died a day or so ago and everybody's very upset about this. I said, wow, I can't believe it. Walt Dick didn't even tell me that. I guess he doesn't know. Let me call Walt and tell him. So the next day, because it was late at night, I called Walt and I said, Walt, you know, I was over at your house yesterday and I guess you didn't know this, but Bob Gagné died. And Walt and Bob were very close. And Walt said to me, and this was so touching, he said to me, Bob, you know, I knew it. But it was, it was, you were so excited to see me and it was such a sweet time together that I didn't want to reveal to you that fact while I was, while you were at my house. But yes, I know that Bob passed. And that was so typical of Walt, such a good guy and so concerning about other people that he decided to withhold from me, at least for, for that few hours, 
that knowledge so that we could really enjoy the moment. So um, I've always uh, admired Walt and his, um, his attitudes, and this was just one example of that. And uh, Bob, you have already had, you had a lot of, uh, I mean, you're, you're, because to our standard, you're very lucky because uh, you yourself is a very achieved um, professor and scholar in this field. And also in your early years, you have the opportunity and luck to work with so many big names and including the one and very, the only, Bob <laughs> Ghanai. So can you tell us a little bit about your interaction, your working experience and or friendship with Bob Ghanai? Sure. You know, um... In 1976, I was lucky enough to get a job at Florida State, and uh, I expected to stay here in Tallahassee, where Florida State is located, for just three years, but have, because my wife and I wanted to go back to the big city, back to New York, where we grew up. And, but um, I had, because of all those great people there at Florida State, and the, and the enjoyment and growth I had from working with them, ha, I'm still at Florida State over 40 years later. Uh, but Bob Gagné... You, you thought it was only three years and then you end up 40. <laughs> yes, it's, more, it's almost, now it's actually almost 45. I'm, uh, 45, I'm sorry. I, I started my career at a very young age, and uh, um, fortunately. So I, I, I'm enjoying myself, and I don't see myself retiring anytime soon because I like so much what I'm doing. But let me tell you two stories about Bob Gagné. Uh, I'd only been at Florida State about maybe three, four years, when I was put on a project um, to develop a media selection model for the United States Army. They had instructional designers there. And back then, media was very much different than it is today. You know, you had slideshows, you had film, and you had television, but you didn't have the computer and so on. So anyhow, the instructional designers for the military needed to decide what media to use to design good instruction. So, but, and of course, as we said earlier in our talk today, it, even though the media is important, it's really the message that uh, comes along with the medium that's key. But they needed to figure out what media to use. And Bob Gagné had done a lot of work, of course, with the conditions of learning and so on. So he agreed to work on this project with me. And uh, it was a very successful project. And then when the project ended, uh, I thought, well, we've done so much work and we've created this media selection model, perhaps we could write a book on this topic. So Gagné agreed to write the book and we spent um, several months, maybe eight or nine months working on the book. And uh, we split the work about evenly. And I thought for sure it'd be great, we'd have a book, Gagné and Reeser. And um, Bob went away for the summer. He had a house in the mountains in the summer. It gets very hot in Tallahassee in the summer. So he'd go away to a house in the mountains. And uh, it was about time to publish the book and the publisher, Educational Technology Publications, uh, was ready to, to put it together. So I called Bob and said, Bob, the book's about ready to be published. Um, we need to do these final pieces. And he said, you know, Bob, I, I've been thinking about this. He said this to me and he said, you know, um, even though we split this work evenly, I'd like you to be the senior author on this book. I could not believe that Bob Gagné would uh, ask me to be the first author on a book that I was writing with him. I thought for sure it's going to be Gagné and Reeser, and that was fine. I was delighted just even to be on a book with him. But for right. him to tell me that I could be the first author, I was just blown away by that. And uh, it made me so happy. Uh, so this shows you what a nice person Gagné was. But that leads me into my second story. He, he, as nice as he was, sometimes he would get very frustrated. And when he would get frustrated, he would sort of lose his temper. Um, he would eventually calm down, but he could easily lose his temper. One day, um, in the United States, there was something called the Equal Rights Amendment, the e Equal Rights Amendment. And we were trying to get the Equal Rights Amendment passed by Congress, but they hadn't approved it yet. And one of the, each state had to approve it before it could become law. And Illinois, the state of Illinois in America, had not yet approved it. That year we were having a conference in Chicago, AERA was going to have its conference in Chicago, Illinois. And I wrote a letter to AERA, as did hundreds of other people saying, Let's not have the conference in Chicago because they haven't, Illinois has not passed the Equal Rights Amendment. Let's boycott. Right. 
Okay. So I thought I felt very good about writing that letter. One day I was walking down the corridor in the office and Bob Gagné met me at the elevator. And he said, oh, Bob, it's good to see you. And I said, oh, hi, Bob. And he said, you know, Bob, um, I'm on the AERA board. Oh. And I saw that letter that you wrote. And he said, you know, Bob, I really like Chicago. I really want to have that conference in Chicago. And you can see his face starting to get red. And he says, and nobody like you is going to prevent me from having that conference in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> he was, was on the board. He's a board member. <laughs> he was a board member of AERA at the time, and he wanted that conference in Chicago, and he didn't like that I wrote that letter. I went home that night and said to my wife, I'm never going to get promoted here at Florida <laughs> State. <laughs> but the next day, I saw Bob in the office, and he said, you know, Bob, I'm so sorry. I really got carried away yesterday. And I didn't mean to get you upset. So, uh, you know, he, he had a tendency when he got frustrated to lose his temper. It's, all of us have that a little bit. Uh, but he was a very sweet man, and he would quickly come back to his senses. But I, I love telling that story because uh, <laughs> it was really very funny. And, and also, I remember you mentioned that one of the on your, one of your trips to China that um, uh, over over the dinner that you told you told us a story at one time in your earlier years and just just after you arrived to Florida FSU and then uh, one day Bob Gane came to your office and uh, he told you that he liked you one of the books or article that you wrote or something yeah. like that and you were very proud of. Yes, he. Um... He I asked me, this was a couple of years after we wrote the book together, he was writing a book on trends in our field, kind of a predecessor to my book. It was called Foundations of Instructional Technology. And he knocked on my office door. We were right across the hall from one another. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, uh, Bob, I'm writing this book and I'd like you to write a chapter on the history of the field. And I, I could not believe it because, you know, I was young then. I didn't know much about the history. I was teaching a course where we discussed history a little bit, but I wasn't an expert on that topic. And this, I, I learned a very good lesson, George, that I think is worth sharing with the group. Um, so he said to me, would you be willing to write that chapter on the history? And I said, well, you know, I don't really know that much about it. He said, Bob, I know you could do the research and write that chapter. And I said, I would. And I'm so glad that he gave me that. It would have been very easy for me to say, no, Bob, I really don't have the expertise in there. But by giving me that opportunity, I delved deeply into the history, wrote a very detailed and good chapter. And now, over 40 years later, because he asked me this in about 1980, maybe 1982, uh, mm -hmm. I still am considered one of the leading historians in the field because I did that work back mm -hmm. then. So the le lesson to be learned there is when an opportunity presents itself, I, you shouldn't be quick to say no. You really need to take advantage of these opportunities. And if it looks like a good one, even if you don't feel you have the expertise in the area, pursue it because it could turn to ver into very great things. And that certainly happened in that example. Thank you. Thank you. That's a really good advice to all of your viewers, young viewers, because sometimes right. and, uh, the opportunity show, show itself up in front of you uh, is... is in, in disguise of over capacity or over your capability, your current capability, but never said it will crush on your potential because your potential is, is unknown. Yes, right. So, um, you know, I, if, if I were given another opportunity like that, um, I would make sure that I had at least the time to do the work. But if I felt I had the time, I would, as I did in this case, I said yes. Uh, the one thing you need to be cautious about, I'm talking to, to you who are listening to this presentation, is don't commit yourself to things that you don't have the time for. Because once you commit to something, it's really essential that you do it and you do it well. As I said earlier in the presentation today, when I first joined AECT, I volunteered for some tasks. And once I volunteered to do it, I made sure to do it and do it well. And I always, when I get involved in these tasks, especially if it involves a lot of people, I keep them informed. They say, here's the progress we've made so far. Here's what we still need to do. And when people see that you're responsive and you're responsible, they will really appreciate you and give you new things to do. But if they see that you take on a task and you don't do it, then <laughs> it, it really puts a black mark on your reputation. So exactly. take advantage of these opportunities, but make sure when you do that, 
that you actually follow through and do the work. You bet, you bet. When opportunities come and knock on door, that doesn't happen all the time. It doesn't happen all the time. Thank you, thank you. That's a really great advice to young practitioners uh, like many of our viewers are. And uh, Bob, you have been in this field for so many decades and you have come across so many great names. The other great names that I want to mentioned he's not a um, faculty member of FSU but he's also very known in the field ben Dr. Benjamin Bloom. Benjamin Bloom and his taxonomies and his mastery learning and uh, so on and so forth. So can you tell us do you, do you know him? Have you met him? And I, I you... met Bloom once because Bloom and Gagne, you know Gagne and Bloom worked among the leading figures. If I show Gagne and Bloom was like Gagne, the top figure in the field of instructional design and technology. Right. Bloom, uh, went, went also one of the leading figures in, in several different areas. And Gagne invited mm -hmm. Bloom to speak at FSU, and Bloom came and spoke, and I met him. I didn't get to know him well, but fortunately, uh, a lot of my research in my career, especially in the first 15 years or so, centered around mastery learning, which was a concept that Bloom uh, started. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. I want to say one other thing about Bloom. He was a very short man. He was, he was not tall at all. And, uh, uh, but in spite of the fact that he was so short, he had a physical presence, and especially with the way he told, that people would listen and really uh, buy into, accept his ideas. And one of the, he had two major uh, ideas that have affected our field greatly. And George has mentioned both of them. The first one is Bloom's taxonomy when he described the various types of learning outcomes and how it's important to differentiate between the lower level learning outcomes and the higher level ones. If you haven't read about Bloom's taxonomy in the cognitive domain, I suggest that you do so because that's a very important notion. Gagne, by the way, followed up and he had a similar type of a set of right. uh, learning outcomes. But the other thing that Bloom was famous for was mastery learning. And early in my career, I found out about mastery learning and became enamored with it and uh, taught courses where I covered that topic. And actually, I did about five or six research studies, including my dissertation on the topic of mastery learning. And fortuitously, I have a se series of slides that I created quite a few years ago and just recently updated for you. Uh, okay. That covers it. So if you could share, if you would allow me to share my screen now, George, I've put up the first of about 10 slides that I'll cover rather quickly. Okay. Okay, so I think uh, your, your audience sees the slides now. Let me go to slide view. Okay, so um, let me talk a little bit about Bloom's conceptual model of mastery learning. Uh, back in the early 1960s, Benjamin Bloom wrote a very influential article that had a tremendous effect on the field of education. Uh, particularly for people who believe in the value of instructional design. And this all centered around the notion of instructional time, as you see here on the mm -hmm. slide. Um, Bloom uh, said that in the traditional approaches to instruction, we give everyone the same amount of time to learn something. And because students live at diff le learn at different rates, some students can pick up a concept very quickly, others take more time, and of course, that differs by content area. For example, George might be very good at math, and he might be able to pick up math concepts very quickly, whereas I might not be able to pick them up so quickly. So if you were teaching me and George, and you gave both of us the same amount of time to, to learn something in math, George would most likely, in that limited period of time, learn more than I would. So the amount that we would learn would vary. Uh, and this is often happens in instruction, because we set aside uh, an hour to give a lecture, then we give our students a day to study at home, and then uh, perhaps later in the week we give them a test. And because George is good in math, he has enough time to learn those concepts, but Bob is not as good and he doesn't learn as much. So you've given us both the same amount of time, but the amount we learn is varied because George learns more quickly. Now, if it was a different subject, perhaps, I don't know, let's pick one, uh, English, maybe I'm a quicker learner than George. In that case, if you gave us the same amount of time, I would learn more than George. But the basic idea is when you keep time the same, the amount of time you teach people and give them to learn, then the amount they learn is going to vary depending on their aptitude for learning that topic. Bloom said, well, 
what, we can, what can we do about that? Why don't we let time vary among students? So if George learns something more quickly, we can give him, he can learn it in a quicker period of time. Let's give Bob the extra time needed so he can learn it. And if we do that, then Bob and George are gonna both learn the concept. George might learn it in two days. Bob might take three days, but let's give Bob the extra time to learn it. So at a conceptual level, this makes a lot of sense. Um, the key principle of, and I'm gonna explain how you put this into uh, actual practice in a moment. But the key principle here is because students learn at different rates, some learn quicker than others, depending on the subject area. We need to vary the amount of time we give them to learn in order for each student to master the skills we want them to master. This is the key principle of mastery learning. So I'm um, speaking quickly here, maybe some of you are mastering this and some of you are taking, need more time to do it, but you'll be able to go back to those slides and understand these concepts fully. So the definition then of mastery learning, at least from my point of view, is that mastery learning is an instructional approach that allows instructional time to vary among students, giving more, some students more time, some less, so that each student can spend as much time as he needs in order to master or to acquire each skill. That's where the word mastery comes from. Mastery learning means give them enough time to master each skill you're mm -hmm. trying to teach them. Right. Um, this is, Bloom came up with this conceptual idea and then he passed it off to one of his students, James Block. Let me go back a slide. Uh, and James Block, working off of the ideas from Bloom, came up with a model for how we could actually put Bloom's idea into practice in a classroom. So here's what uh, Block suggested. He said, we should normally, if you're a regular teacher in a regular classroom, be it uh, K through 12 or higher education, uh, you should start your instruction as any teacher does. You present your first unit of instruction to the entire class. Maybe you have a class lecture, you have some discussions and so on. And then you can test the students like you normally do to see whether they've learned them. But whereas in a traditional classroom, after the test is over, the teacher then goes on to the second unit. That's a problem because if some students have acquired the skills, they're ready to learn the next concept. But if some students haven't acquired the skills, they're gonna have difficulty understanding that next concept if, if the first concept is related to it. So students start falling behind, they fall further and further behind as mm -hmm. new concepts are thrown at them and they haven't yet acquired the skills uh, that they were previously needed to have. So what do we do? <clears throat> mm -hmm. Black said, after you test the students, instead of simply giving this student an A, this student a B, and this student an F, you ask the question, did the students master the test? Did they pass the test? Did they acquire the skills you mm -hmm. wanted them to acquire? If some students haven't acquired those skills, instead of just moving on to the next unit, you give them some time to remediate. You might have another student who's acquired the skills, help them learn. Uh, you might have the students go back and read some other materials, but you give them some additional time. Remember we said we need to provide additional time if they haven't first acquired the skills. And then you retest the students and hopefully as a result of their getting some remediation, the vast majority of them when they're retested have now acquired the skills. Now what's happening in the meantime for the students who did master the skills? Um, what Bl Block suggested is Give them some enrichment activities. So if George, for example, has learned some basic skill uh, related to algebra, and he's done it uh, kind of using just letters and numbers, maybe we give him some real world problems to work on so he can uh, enrich his understanding of that while Bob here is getting remediation. Now, in the ideal world, we give Bob as much time as he needed to remediate. And if he didn't pass the retest, we give him even more time, more remediation, but if we did that, um, poor George here, who's gotten the remediation, is waiting and waiting for Bob to move on. So we have to limit, according to Block, the amount of time we can give students to remediate in a regular classroom. So we give them some additional time, which usually results in the vast majority of them acquiring the skills, and then we move on to the next unit of instruction. So if we simply moved on to this next unit at this point, Maybe only 65% of the students will have acquired the skills and be ready to move on to unit two. But if we give time for remediation, maybe we have 90% of the students now right. ready to move on. So this is a very good approach to use because it provides extra time for students to acquire the skills if they haven't acquired it, but it still enables us to use regular group instruction and um, 
but get a larger percentage of the students to master. Those were the basic principles. I'm going to stop for in a minute, George, but let me put up one more slide. So the learning from mastery approach, the approach that Bloom and Bach at Block advocated was based on their work. It was used for over 20 years in elementary and secondary schools. It's kind of fallen out of use now for reasons that are hard to explain, but it provided some additional time for students who needed it and it resulted in a much larger percentage of students mastering the skills they needed to master. I'm going to talk about a second approach to mastery learning in a moment. But first, let me see, George, is there anything you'd like to say or any questions you'd like me to ask about this? You'd like to I ask think, me about this? Yes, mastery of uh, uh, the LFM or mastery learning is very one of the uh, biggest achievements of Benjamin Blue. Uh, he is often, often, oftentimes, he's known for his taxonomies, but uh, the LFM is also another achievement that he and Block tested for many years and applied and really helped the uh, American educational system and also later on in the corporate world too to, yes. uh, for, for its application and really helped the re retain. I mean, all the purpose of learning, the purpose of training or learning or, is all for re ret retention. So we, how much we retain, how much with well, the quality of training, basically, how much we return and how much we convert from short-term memory to long-term memory through encoding. So it is really providing using different ways to, to increase the amount of, 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 of retention and then, you know, for later retrieval, but for the retention, this is, this is major. This is a ma major step back in the sixties. You know, that was like half century ago. Yes, but it's, it, I'm glad that you mentioned, George, that it's used in business and industry. They don't use the term mastery learning anymore. Right. But lots of corporations now do this. You know, the whole idea, as George said a moment ago, is when you're providing training for workers, is for them to learn the skills you want them to learn. And in order for every worker to acquire the skills that you, they need to acquire, some of them are gonna acquire it more quickly than others. So if we just keep on throwing more content at them, some of our workers are gonna acquire the necessary skills and others are not. But if we give them sufficient time, all of them can acquire those skills or the vast majority of them can. So when you're in a corporate environment, providing additional time for learners to acquire skills is really essential. Um, I, there's one other, uh, there's a slide or two that's not in this set. Uh, that they used in the account in a, an accounting firm in the United States, I think it was an Arthur Anderson Company, uh, that used the mastery learning approach. If we have a minute or two, I'll find those slides and share those with you. So this whole notion of allowing time to vary among learners so that all, all right. of them could acquire skills is crucial for both uh, K-12, higher education, and in the corporate world. Let me share with you briefly a second set of uh, slides. Right, Three just one more, one, more comment, uh, uh, one more comment is that it really provides the students with confidence and uh, make them you know, confident to learn because I already learned, learned that one and then I'm, I'm, I'm ready for the next one. So I'm exactly ready for, right. for, for the next block of, of, of instructions. Yes, it gets people confident, self-reliant. Right. Uh, so I, it's, that's very important too. And I'm gonna share one slide that shows you the results of a bunch of studies that show how effective mastery learning is. But let me just go over three or four other slides. There's a second approach to mastery learning called the Personalized System of Instruction or PSI. Yes, and this was developed by a, a man called, named Fred Keller, not to be confused with John Keller, who's right. very well known for his work and motivation. Fred Keller, uh, preceded John by many years. He's, he's an old, he's now passed away. Uh, Fred has. John, thank God, is healthy and doing very nicely. But Fred Keller was at Columbia University in New York City. Then he went to Brazil and created this personalized system of instruction and then went to Arizona State. And the reason why Arizona State is in bold here is because I went to Arizona State as a graduate student. When I got there, uh, Keller had already retired but one of his students was now using this approach, the personalized system of instruction approach, which is also a mastery learning approach at Arizona State. I met him and did my dissertation and then about another 10 years worth of research studies all around this approach to mastery learning called the personalized system of instruction. The personalized system of instruction is similar to the uh, learning from mastery approach that Bloom advocated, 
but it's different in one crucial way. Uh, what we looked at before under blo Bloom and Block's approach was providing students with some additional time, right. but they were concerned about holding other students back in a traditional classroom. So they didn't allow time to completely vary among students. They gave some additional time, but not a, a great deal of additional time. Keller instead said, the way I'm gonna set up instruction is I'm gonna have students study on their own using self-instructional materials, um, some unit of instruction. It could be very small, it could be rather large, but we set aside some time for them or as much time as they'd like to study of a unit instruction on their own. And then when they're ready, whenever they're ready, they come into a testing center and take a test over that unit of instruction. Then if the student does pass or master the test, he or she moves on to the next unit of instruction. If the student doesn't, so assume this is me and George again, we're mm -hmm. studying a unit on math. We right. take the test. George, mm -hmm takes the test after three days because he studied these materials, feels very confident. He takes the test after three days and masters it. He then can move on on his own because it's self-instruction materials to the next unit. So in day four, George is already on to unit number two. Bob, on the other hand, is studying this first unit and I'm having difficulty with it or something happens at home and I can't take the time to study it. So maybe it's two weeks before Bob mm -hmm. is ready to take that first test. But I come in and take the test, and unfortunately, because I didn't study enough, I don't master the test. If I don't master the test, I then need to go back and either restudy the unit or get some remedial instruction. And eventually, by get, taking as much time as I need, there should mostly be a box down here that says provide remediation for the student. I don't know why it's not there. So I don't master the test. I get some remedial help, maybe some a tutor who's already acquired these skills to helps me. Uh, I'm then studying some more. I take the test again, and eventually I pass it. But maybe it's taken me two weeks to pass it. That's fine. I then study unit two after two weeks. George, by now, might already be on unit five. But that shouldn't trouble uh, the instructor because people are proceeding at their own pace and studying self-instructional materials. Uh, so this is how Keller's approach differed from Bloom's approach. It was more of a self-instructional approach rather than traditional classroom approach. And it gave students as much time as they needed to master the content. This became a very popular approach in college classrooms, more so than in K-12 classrooms. But the one shortcoming with this approach was some people were taking so long to right. acquire skills that they would never finish the courses. <laughs> that turned out to be a big problem. So it would be at the end of the semester, you'd have 70% of the students who've mastered all the skills, maybe George mastered them after just five weeks, even though the course is 15 weeks. So mm -hmm. he's already completed the course, which is fine. Others completed it in 10 or 15 weeks, that's fine. But Bob has been plodding along and it's now the 15th week and Bob has only completed five of the 15 units in the course. What do we do? Well, Bob can either withdraw from the course and retake it or he's gonna get a failure. So this problem of withdrawals turned out to be a major a problem with Keller's approach. People came up with, and actually my dissertation was on this topic, ways to encourage students to finish more rapidly, giving them rewards for completing units more quickly and so on, but still allowing them as much time as they needed to master. So this was Keller's approach to mastery learning. So uh, both these approaches, the PSI approach by Keller and the learning for mastery approach by Bloom were very popular in America and are still used mainly in corporate America under different names. But the basic notion under these approaches is give students enough time to acquire the skills they need to so that they actually master them and not go into the work environment without having the skills they need to. Uh, what does research tell us about these approaches to mastery learning? There've been hundreds of studies, most of them conducted in the 70s and 80s uh, on comparing mastery learning approaches to traditional approaches. And a fellow named James Kulik, K-U-L-I-K, uh, wrote a very famous review of all the research on this topic. And here's what he found. He said when he compared the final examination performance at the end of a semester or at the end of a year between students who took mastery learning courses versus courses that were taught in the traditional way, students in the mastery learning courses learn significantly more and students who were taught traditionally. That was very interesting, but what about their long-term retention? Could they 
retain that knowledge over a long period of time versus the kids in the traditional classroom, the results there were very similar. Long-term retention, maybe a year later, one semester later, for those who took mastery learning courses was much greater than students who took traditional courses. George talked earlier about attitudes and confidence, and that too proved to be a big benefit of mastery learning. Uh, Kulik found that in all these studies he looked at, students who uh, were, when they assessed students' attitudes about which instructional method did you like better, because they would put some in, they'd, they'd measure the attitudes of the kids in the mastery learning courses and compare that to the attitudes of the students in traditional courses. And invariably, students who took the mastery learning courses said they liked the course very much, where students in traditional courses had mixed opinions. Their attitudes weren't as possible. And the same held true for attitudes towards subject matter. Students who are in the mastery learning courses, because they gained confidence, as George said earlier, in their ability to acquire these skills, had much more positive attitudes towards what they had learned and desired to learn more than students in traditional courses. So all these outcomes, learning outcomes, were very positive. And Kulik said in his article, I don't think I have it on the next slide. No, I don't. Oh, yes. I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. So Kulik felt mastery learning was really a major innovation, so very important to helping students learn. And here's what he said, actually. This is the article that he wrote, uh, Kulik, Kulik, and Robert Bangert, Bangert Drowns. Actually, I know Bob Bangert Drowns very well. Uh, he's at another university, University of Albany in New York. Uh, in 1990, they said this, we recently reviewed meta-analyses, which are statistical reviews of the research literature. They're like literature reviews where they look at lots of research studies on a particular mm -hmm. topic. And they said, we looked at research uh, reviews in 40 areas of educational research. One of them was, of course, mastery learning. And he said, few educational treatments of any sort were consistently associated with the positive ach achievement effects as those produced by mastery teaching. So here's people who... Uh, whose careers are built around reviewing literature to see what techniques work best. And they said in 1990, mastery learning is one of the most effective approaches you can use. That's why I'm so excited. You can even hear it, I think, in my voice now. Uh, 30 years after they wrote this, I'm still very enthusiastic about the concept of mastery learning. I did, as I said, many studies in my career examining this approach. I used it in some of my classes, and I'm really... Um, excited and thrilled about it. And I encourage you, uh, if you're gonna be working in corporate, America, in corporate China or in the classrooms, to look into mastery learning and see if you can use some version of it with your students. The one caveat again is if we give students an inordinate amount of time, uh, they may end up not taking the time they need to learn the content, they get caught up in other things. So that's the one uh, concern about mastery learning. Mm -hmm. George, I've said a lot about this topic, most likely more than people needed to know, but do you want to add anything or you want to ask me any questions about it? This is a very, uh, you, you did, uh, you, you, well, well, not enough, <laughs> what you said. I mean, uh, I think our audience are always uh, eager to learn about mastery learning. And what's the, what was the uh, um, uh, implications of mastery learning? Because, because if we allow, I mean, the corporate world, as you just imagine, corporate China or corporate America, in the corporate setting, if we allow them to learn longer, uh, you know, that means cost. So yes, how do we do very, it? That's a very do? good point, George. What so, do we do about it? Yes. So the key there, and it's, it's very helpful now, because with online learning, it's very easy to have our students go through instructional materials, learning materials, without having to take time off from work. You, you can mm -hmm. put them in a different environment outside of the regular learn time. You might have them go off work to study and have them learn this on their own. So they can do this independent mm -hmm. of uh, their work time. Of course, that means they're spending extra time on their own. But if you put incentives into the system, so as you reward your employees for learning these additional skills, whether you give them certificates or bonuses or longer vacation time, uh, if you have them study on their own and take the tests as needed, they're going to master the skills and be able to move on without right. devoting a lot of training time that would take away from their work time to do that. I was going to try to find one other set of slides that I had here. Let sure. me go back in a minute. Uh, that shows you a real world example of that. Um, 
from business and industry. As I said, it was from an account. This is a this is a general guideline or methodology at a philosophical or a structural level. But at different settings, corporate settings, I I'm sure that there are different you know uh, environments and circumstances that they can you know easily adapt to adapt this methodology to. Yes, very good, George. Yeah, you know we have a tendency uh, in our field or people live outside of a field to see a flow chart. <laughs> um, and say, oh, it's very linear. I have to do it exactly that Over way. Over generalization. That's, not the, case at all. That's right. not the case at all. You can adapt it to your particular set of circumstances. Right. And, you know, maybe just give students a little extra time. So if you're in the corporate world, you realize, you know, we can't uh, expect our students to go, our, our workers to go off work and spend another 20 hours above their 40 hours of work each week and study. How can I do this in a, in a more efficient way? So maybe you just set aside two additional hours where they can meet with people who have the expertise to try to acquire those skills and then see if they've acquired them. So you can adapt this in all different manners. I have a, a slides, which I'm having trouble finding. I'm gonna try one more place. Maybe this is it. Yes, okay, this is good. This is an example of how this was actually done with a large accounting firm. Um, uh, that was trying to teach new accountants in their company how to perform certain accounting operations that were unique to that company, that weren't things that you could learn while they were in school. And they basically came up with a model that looks very much like um, the model we showed you that uh, Keller uh, adapted. Mm -hmm. So the first thing they would do, because they're teaching these accountants some skills that are unique to their company, is they give them a pretest because perhaps mm -hmm. some of these accountants, even though they were new to the company, already knew how to do these things that the company thought was unique to that company. So they give them a pretest. Yeah. And if the, if the accountants already had the skills that they thought they needed that were unique to the company, they just let them move on to the next unit or just have them go into the work environment and not have to take any uh, instruction. But if a number of the accountants did not have these skills and they figured that a lot would, would not because they were unique to that company, those skills, they'd have them study a unit on that particular topic. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't recall how much time they gave them to study it, but I would imagine it was a fixed amount of time. Maybe they got instruction in the classroom. Maybe they had them study on their own. I really don't recall. But after giving them a fixed amount of time to something, to learn that those particular set of skills, they'd have them take a post test and much like under the uh, Keller method, if they pass the post test, they could move on to the next unit. Or if it was only one unit, they'd be ready to go on to the job and perform their task. But if they didn't pass it, they'd give them some type of learning prescription, some guidelines as to how they could acquire these skills that they hadn't acquired when they first learned the unit. It might have involved working under the guidance of a more senior account. It might have invi inv involved giving them a video to watch. Maybe the initial instruction was a classroom instruction delivered by an expert accountant. So maybe now they show them a video that's somewhat different, but they give them some learning prescription to help them acquire these skills. Then they would give them the test again. And if they pass, they move on to the next unit. I imagine that at some point, if people weren't passing this test or the series of tests, the, the accounting company would do something, most likely uh, move the person into a different position, or maybe yeah. after a year say, you know, you haven't acquired all these skills you need to leave, but the accounting firm used this model, or which is similar to the PSI model, to teach the new accountants the skills that were unique to their, their company. Let's see if there's, oh, and here are the results. Uh, they, they actually did a study to see what, it resulted in improved attitudes and motivation among the learners. The, the learners who went through this approach as opposed to learners in the accounting company who had studied under a more traditional approach earlier, when they compared them, they found that the participants in the new approach liked the new approach. They liked it very much. They stated it helped facilitate their learning and they were motivated to do well. Uh, oh, there was a, a capstone course after the end of, I forget how long it was, the end of the first year, they had a situation where the accountants would go, all the accountants who were new in the company would go off to another location uh, to have a, a kind of a, a retreat where they learn more skills, but also could celebrate their first year on the job and uh, the accomplishments they had acquired in the first year. And, it, and um, they found that participants who'd gone through this new approach, when they went to take this capstone course, 
this uh, away from the normal office, end of the first year, a get together, the students were better prepared to take that course than those who had gone through the traditional type of instruction the previous year. The participants got the maximum benefit from this mastery learning course, and they were now better prepared to do their jobs. And they also found there were time savings. There was more time for the participants to be on the job. The more time resulted in participants able to, great, to generate greater revenue for the company. And it resulted in a course savings of a half a million dollars over six years for wow. that company as a result of implementing this. And this is net uh, gains, net savings. Right. So uh, it wasn't, you know, taking into account all the time necessary to create these additional materials, come up with this new approach. The company still saved six, a half a million dollars over a six year period as a result of using this mastery learning approach. So I'm so glad that George has mentioned you can adapt these approaches, these mastery learning approaches to work in business and industry. And this is one example of how that was done with a large accounting firm in the United States. I think it was Arthur Anderson Accounting back in, I think this was in the uh, late 70s or 70s, early 80s. Yeah, I would say this would be the 70s. And these are, these are very, very good. I think, I, th I think the key word in this, in, in this model or in the application or uh, Arthur Anderson case is that confidence and also flexibility because once the learners is is basically a learner centered model is a paradigm shift you yes, know it's yes yes very good george we 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 move it into a, it's a paradigm shift and then we put the learner in the center we care how much they learn so if you haven't learned we'll give you more time you have learned we give you more enriched material for you to further strengthen your skills and knowledge and then uh with one purpose retention. And then once you have the retention, then you're more satisfied, or you're more motivated to go on to the next block, next part of, of instruction. So yes. I think it's a, kind of a staggering up, you know, it go, goes up. Yes, I think, I think you're, very, you're very right. And you know, you won't hear the term mastery learning mentioned perhaps at all anymore. But if you go into a lot of companies, or you go into the military where training is taking place, you'll see a modified mastery learning approach being oh, used yeah. in many of these settings, M meaning that they're giving students additional time to acquire the skills they need to acquire to become more confident and to do their jobs better. So please, uh, viewers, think about using some type of mastery learning approach uh, when you get into an environment where you're trying to train people or educate people uh, to acquire specific skills. Especially uh, with the virtual learning, with the technology. Well, this model came out of like late 1960s and then 70s. So there's a lot of application. But look at now. I mean, virtual learning is everywhere. It's learner centered with the technology. We put the learner in the middle, and and now, you know, with the uh, with the with the development of LMS, early LMS and LCMS and all the LMSs. It is repeatable learning. I mean, you can learn as many times as possible, especially under the corporate setting, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can learn as many as possible. That solved the problem. That solved that problem of, you know, you, you can, you can, you can uh, the organization needs to give you more time to learn and uh, to, 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 to encode. So virtual- this is very good. Another term you use, George, that I really like is the learner-centered approach. You know, uh, oftentimes uh, instructors um, are more concerned about what they're teaching and how they're teaching than about what their students learn. Right. So, you know, we want to design good instruction, but the purpose isn't to show off how much we know. The purpose is to help our learners acquire the skills we want them to learn. And when we don't learn, the skills, we often say, oh, those learners, they, they weren't motivated, they're, they're lazy, they're not smart enough. But in fact, and I think I said this earlier in my presentation today, in fact, oftentimes it's because we didn't do a good job of instructing. We need to focus on the learners and what they learn, not on, uh, um, I'm delivering a wonderful lecture here. You want to deliver wonderful instruction or to help your uh, people who are going to be delivering the instruction do a good job of it. But the way to assess the effect is, how much did the students learn? Right, exactly. 
Thank you, thank you. This, this, uh, what, what is a popular name? I mean, it's not called. I mean, it's not called mastery learning anymore. But um, is there any? Yeah, I don't think there is a term for it any longer. Right. I think it's a. Okay. Is I, no matter what the environment is, they have different words for it. But what you need to do is go look in the situation, and if you see that time is being, that they're allowing learners more time to acquire skills if they haven't acquired them to begin with. That's basically a mastery learning approach. I, I think, I think this theory. is, yeah, I think this is one of the cornerstone theories or fun, foundational theories and the cornerstones that, you know, all the things that we do, we're still doing is based on this theory. Yes. And, you know, most of the online learning today is of this variety because students are learning things online asynchronously at their own pace. That's mastery learning. But people don't use that term anymore. So, right. uh, um, Keep well, that in mind, people, as you're as you're going through courses or as you're designing instruction. Right. What's your, uh, you know, there's one of the uh, branches, a personalized, uh, personalized uh, system of instruction, the PSI. But uh, so anyway, I would suggest, you know, let's rejuvenize it. Let's revive it. You know, and make it back into mastery learning. When? Why not? I mean, sure. it is one of the focus. I always say to my clients that, you know, do not follow this concept and that concept. And because once you are falling into that kind of a trap, you know, you're, 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 you're chasing one concept, you're missing a lot of others. But just do what things should be done. And then all the other theories, models, methodologies, process and concepts and definition and tools and process, everything will come back to you because you have done things right the right way very good i like that and uh we can will come back to you if, we, if you take it to some of the key basic notions of our field things like careful instructional design exactly uh, mastery learning and modify them in the environment you're in you're going to ha have a very good product at the end exactly exactly thank you that's very inspirational thank you bob sure happy to do it um, uh, let me let me hit on the other questions that um, you have many mentors. Well, you have several key mentors. Uh, I, I remembered. You can change me. Uh, who are the most influential mentors or figures in your in your career development? Because we have our viewers are most of them are very young. Yes. Okay. Um, I've I've mentioned two of the. I guess three who were the most uh, influential in my career. I've already mentioned uh, Bob Gagne certainly was influential in my career, getting me early on to work on a book with him and making me the senior author, learning from him as I saw how he went about uh, writing his chapters in the book, uh, coming into his office often and seeing how he thought. And oftentimes he'd say, he'd come into my office and say, Bob, what do you think about this? And I would be amazed that a senior scholar like Gagne would ask right. for my opinion. And I gave it to him and he would say, you know, I hadn't thought about it that way. That's very interesting. So Gagne, uh, between what he taught me and the confidence he gave me by asking my opinion, getting me, certainly had a major influence. The other two people who had a major influence in my career, one was Walter Dick. Uh, like Gagne, Walt was already at Florida State when I came there. Of course, he's very famous for the Dick and Carry model of instructional design. Right. And uh, he was a little older than me. Gagne was considerably older than I was. But Walt also took me under his wing. He was a very quiet, uh, considerate person, uh, very knowledgeable. And uh, we, he and I hit it off immediately. We became good friends. And to this day, we still keep in touch with one another. He's living now in Alabama. Uh, and I'm in Florida and New York. But uh, Walt and I did a lot of research studies together. I would often go into his office and ask for his advice because I always thought he had a very considerate opinions. He wouldn't jump up and just say something. He'd think it through carefully. So the way he handled himself, his thinking, uh, his bright ideas really influenced me a great time. Many times I became chairman of my department. I'd come into a dilemma. I'd say, Walt, what would you do in this case? And invariably he'd have some good advice for me. I wrote a very famous article where I talked about the um, Dick Clark's notion. We talked about this earlier of the right. uh, refrigeration, ref refrigerate trucks the being, clock, the, yep. yeah, the yep. delivery, delivering uh, instruction, but it's the worst. But Walt, I have a very good small chapter where I kind of uh, refute some of Clark's ideas. And I discussed that with you earlier, George, the idea of that 
you know, you need a special kind of truck depending on whether the, the fruit, the vegetables and fruits are, need to be refrigerated. Uh, Walt helped me come up with that suggestion. So he, he's had a major influence on my career. And the first person, and I haven't mentioned him before, but I'm mentioning him now, mm -hmm. who had an influence on my career was a man named Howard Sullivan. Howard Sullivan was a professor at Arizona State University where I went to graduate school. Howard was very famous for two reasons. He created a lot of curriculum materials for use in K-12 system. He used to work for a research lab out on the west coast of the uh, United States in California where mm -hmm. they created K-12 materials. And Howard was really an expert at designing instruction and had a great influence on K-12 learning, particularly in the areas of reading and science education. Mm -hmm. uh, I became Howard's student at Florida State, at Arizona State. Arizona. Yes, and Howard was an outstanding writer. He was the editor for many years for the leading journal in our field, Educational Technology Research and Development. And Howard was really good at helping me hone my writing skills. I pride myself as being a very good writer, writing very clearly. And a matter of fact, in my book that I've written, where I have about 40 different authors writing various chapters, one of the things I often hear from my authors are, Bob, you did such a good job of editing my chapter. Where did you learn those skills? I learned that from Howard, because he was such a good editor. When I would hand in a paper to him, this was before we had track changes and Word. Right. Uh, he, I'd see right. red marks all over my page from where right. he edited it. But I, those skills proved to be so valuable to me. So I, I, Howard just was a wonderful mentor. And he's, he was a mentor for many of the leading figures in our field. Another one who just passed away just a couple of weeks ago was Michael Hannafin. Mike Hannafin, I know, George, if you knew that, Mike died. Um, Mike, unfortunately, passed away. He had cancer and died only about a month ago. But uh, Howard taught Mike Hannafin. Kind of an impact model, right? Yes, Over right. There? That's right. Yeah, Mike, right. yeah. Uh, he taught Very another sad. fellow uh, named, um, a woman named Willie Savigny, who's very well known in our field. So Howard was a mentor to many of our leading figures in the field. And I, uh, to this day, uh, admire Howard so much. Matter of fact, we've created a family tree, an academic family tree with Howard uh, being the, the trunk of the tree and all these branches coming off, all of his students, all of his students' students. It's a really, uh, I'm very proud of that tree. I actually uh, uh, had it put together in memory of Howard. So uh, he was the third great influence on my career. So I say those three people, Howard Sullivan, Walter Dick, and Bob Gagne were the three. I want to mention one other who had an indirect but very important effect on my field, and that's Bob Morgan. Bob Morgan oh, was yeah, of course. yes. Bob Morgan was the chairman of the uh, educational research department at Florida State University, and also the head of a, a the Learning Systems Institute there, which was an on-campus institute that did a lot of work internationally and also helping improve instruction on the Florida State campus. And it was Bob Morgan who hired me at Florida State in 1976 and really set my career in motion. And Bob, throughout uh, the time he was at Florida State, which was from maybe the late 60s until about the year 2000, uh, did a tremendous job in building a program from nothing to the number one program in the country, most likely in the world. He brought Gagne, uh, Leslie Briggs, Bob Branson, uh, Roger Kaufman, all the major figures in the field to Florida State. And uh, I always thank Bob so much for how he got me started and how while I was at Florida State, he always was a big supporter of me. And if you look at my uh, signature on the bottom of the emails I send out, it lists me as the Robert M. Morgan Professor. Exactly. Of instruction. So I have a, I, I'm in an endowed chair position at Florida State, and I've named that chair after the person who brought me to Florida State, Bob Morgan. Yes, yes, very proudly. I saw that, and uh, I read in your bios and, and, and intros, you're the Bob, uh, Bob Morgan uh, uh, pro, uh, pro, uh, uh, Bob Morgan <laughs> uh, Professor there. Yes, that's right. Uh, and uh, you, yeah, that's 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 really an honor. I mean, Bob Morgan. He, uh, I, when uh, John uh, John Keller, uh, Dr. John Keller, also Bob Branson, told me that uh, Bob Morgan did a lot of good jobs, especially to the Korean yes uh, educational system. He spent a lot, whole lot of years on on them. And uh, the president of 
of South Korea really treated treated him like a state guest. Yes, because Bob Korea, and you may have heard the story from Branson and or Keller, but Korea back in the early to mid 60s, I believe it was, was right. converting from an agricultural co- economy to an industrial economy. Right. And they, unfortunately, the students in their schools were not getting the skills they needed to be ready to go into an industrial economy. So they asked Morgan to come in and change their K through six or K through five elementary school system. And Morgan, with several other people at Florida State, Bob Branson being one of them, went in and completely revamped their educational system. And a lot of uh, people in Korea uh, indicate that it was the work that Bob did that really helped them move from an agricultural economy to an industrial economy. And to this day, he's revered in Korea. Um, Bob, many, many, I'd say well over 50 uh, South Koreans came through the doctoral program at Florida State because they had heard about Bob and what he did. And when Bob was having ill health and uh, we were trying to raise money to create a learning lab in his name, the Koreans got together and gave us a large contribution to create that lab in memory, well, in, in honor of Bob. Unfortunately, he passed away. He, he, he was able to see the creation of the lab, but he passed away shortly thereafter. Right, right. Uh, also a legendary figure, but the legacy goes on. Yes, right. Yes, that's The right. legacy yeah. went on and he carried on. on by many, many important figures like yourself. And, you know, and uh, there's so many great, great names there. Also Walter Dick, Roger Kaufman, yourself, and uh, Bob Branson, John Keller. Bob Morgan, oh gosh, just, just. Yeah, there's, I, I could also mention a couple others. We, uh, Marcy Driscoll, who's a major figure in our field. Uh, she came through up her, Marcy Driscoll, and Walter Wager. So they're also mm-hmm. some big names who uh, were on the faculty. I, I um, have to say that at one point, Jim Russell, who was a professor at Purdue, and Don Ely, who was a professor at Syracuse, both very big names in the field. When they retired, every spring for about 10 years, they would come to Florida State and teach a course for us. And they said, we were like the Mecca, like in uh, the uh, Muslim relation, the Mecca of instruction design. Everybody comes and bows down to right, Florida right. State. So, what I call the Epic Center. They do it. So uh, yeah, I'm very proud of the program there. Um, I'm one of the last ones left. I don't teach in the program anymore. Now I'm in the Dean's office, but I'm still very proud of that program. A friend of mine asked me, uh, her daughter is uh, going to graduate uh, from a college, uh, from a university in China, and they want to go to, uh, go to the United States. And well, with the pandemic, you know, you know, but it's hard to choose. But, and they want to study, guess what? They want to study instructional system design. Good, good, good. And they asked me, oh, uh, Mr. Gu, because you know so many people, you came back from the United States and you, you know the program, you know the field, can you make a few recommendations? And of course, on top, out of my top of my head, FSU. And, uh, but I, 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 I know I make that recommendation because, because of his reputation, but what's the situation now? I mean, are there middle-aged and young-aged and instructors and faculty members there, are they growing up and they're, I mean, they're working yeah, we have hard a very, to We still have a very good program. Uh, the the uh, person who, there's two people who head up the program now. One is Jim Klein. Jim was actually a student at Florida State and studied under John Keller uh, and me, but mainly John, uh, and went off to Arizona State, fun, interestingly, to my alma mater to be mm-hmm. a faculty member there uh, for about 20 years from about the late 1980s until the early 2000s, maybe 2008, something like that. And then uh, we brought him back to Florida State, uh, mm-hmm. and he is now the chairman of the department in which the instructional systems program is located. The program is in a department called Educational uh, psychology and learning systems. So the learning systems part of it uh, is where the instructional uh, systems program is housed. So Jim is on the faculty. Uh, we have a Chinese faculty member who's very good, Feng Feng Ke, Feng Feng Ke, and she does a lot of work uh, with virtual reality uh, um, in different types of learning environments, different media, and she's gotten a lot of federal money to do research in this area. So she's, she's able to hire a lot of graduate students. You know, students who want to go to graduate school, they want to get an assistantship, not only to help pay their way to school, but to acquire skills working under the leadership of somebody who's an expert in an area. And Feng Feng is one of the two faculty in our program who 
who gets a lot of grant money to do research using various media and virtual reality uh, to conduct her research and to create new instructional products. Uh, another person who is getting a lot of funding for her research is Valerie Shute, S-H-U-T-E. And Val does a lot of work with gaming uh, and uh, what she calls stealth assessment, assessing students in a way that isn't paper and pencil assessment, but other means of assessing them. So a lot of students work with her and have been very happy with the skills they've acquired from her. We still get a lot of students uh, from East Asia, particularly China. We used to get mainly from Korea, but now we get mainly students from China. Excellent, excellent students. Um, one of them who went back to your country, I'm blanking on his name right now, invited me to speak at a conference there in Shanghai. I'm, I'm, why am I blanking on his name? It was actually, George, back in 2015 when we had that conference at East China Normal University. Right. Uh, the day before that, um, this individual whose name will come to me eventually uh, right. invited me and he invited business leaders to join us. And there must have been about 40 people from the business world in China at this session that he organized. Uh, so he's one of our many Chinese graduates who's been very successful. So I've now mentioned three faculty, uh, Jim Klein, Val Shoot, and uh, Feng Feng Ke. And a fourth one who's also outstanding is Vanessa Denon. Vanessa done, has done a lot of work with social media. Now social media is very important. People are using social media all the time, not just to converse with one another, but to learn. And Vanessa's done a tremendous amount of work in that area. She's actually the, Jim is the chair of the entire department. Vanessa is the head of the instructional systems program now, and she does a wonderful job. So those are the core members of the faculty. We have others who are on the faculty as well. And actually another fellow whose parents came from China, he's uh, not, he was born in America, and his name is Alan, uh, Alan Zhang. So uh, those are the five key faculty members now in the program, and it's still a very strong program. Uh, I'd be delighted to have some of your viewers eventually come to Florida State, and if they decide to do so, I'd be happy to meet with them. I'm not up in the program any longer, but I'm down in the dean's office. Just come on by. Everybody says, oh, Bob is always willing to meet with them. You of bet. Course, right, now, bet. You, not right now, you'll have to meet me in New York, because I'm in New York, but <laughs> normally I'm down there at Florida State. And I've made many visits to China, I'd say four or five, and often um, I'm invited by or visit former students who are there in China right now. I have another student now uh, who's working at a university in the northern part of Shanghai. I'm, I'm blanking on her name too right now. And one of my most successful Chinese students who's on the faculty at um, Western Kentucky University is Chao Chu. Uh, I can't, uh, Xiao Xia Wang uh, and Xiu Huang, Xiao Xia Huang. Uh, we, she went by Sylvie, but I like to call her Xiao Xia. Uh, and she was one of my Chinese students who stayed in America and now teaches in an online university, Western Kentucky University. So come on down, folks. We're delighted to have you in our bet, You bet. One of my friends, uh, still, she is still in the doctoral program. She's on her dissertation now. So. Oh, who's, what's her name? Uh, Yao, Yao Huang. Oh, yes. Yeah, I, know, I, I don't know her well, I know her. but I know her by name. By yeah, the way, uh, one, other person I want, one, one other person I want to mention is from Taiwan, mm -hmm. and that's Bosco Lee. Bosco uh, came as, a, do you know Bosco Lee at all, jo, uh, uh, George? No, I haven't met him. Uh, Bosco was the president of a university at, um, uh, what is it called? Gu not Guangzhou. Uh, a city in the southern part of Taiwan and was the head of their instruction. Kaohsiung. Yes, right. And he was the head of their educational technology uh, uh, association in Taiwan. And he and I became good friends and he's invited me and I've spoken to groups there in Taiwan on several occasions. So uh, uh, a lot of the Chinese people in Taiwan have also gone through our program and are very successful. Thank you. I I also I do want to. Uh, I'm so glad I asked because uh, I want to know the current uh, strong force and who are the key figures, so that you know China right now doesn't have a strong instructional system design or technology program right now. 
And uh, so I want to interview, can I, uh, can you make another uh, uh, connection in, instead of uh, uh, Walter Dick? Uh, I met Walter Dick uh, before, but uh, Jim, the department I'm chair, I also, yeah, I, I'll send well, you his email. Right, uh, I, want to, I want to interview him as well because he is current. Uh, a lot of professors that I interviewed are retired and uh, he is still there. And I want to, I want to ask him for some of the trends and- uh, Yeah, maybe... Jim would be a great one. Uh, I, I, I'll mention a couple of other programs. You know, I hate to do this because I want everybody to come to Florida State, but some of the other leading programs in the field today are some of the ones that were, e that were popular even 20 years ago. So Indiana remains very strong today. In, you know, oh yeah. Uh, Penn State is a good one. University of Georgia is very strong. Um, those are four that come to mind uh, immediately. FSU, mm -hmm. Indiana, Penn State, Georgia. There are a number of others as well, but I put those among the, the best ones today in our field. Um, so students who are inter not interested might wanna check those programs out. And I'm sure I've missed another half dozen, but I, so you, people who are watching this who are at those other universities will excuse me but these are four of among the best. Right, right. There are others like University of Minnesota, University of San Diego, University, uh, some, New York, oh gosh, the, the list can go on, but the, this, these are the top of the tops. Yes, very good, very good. Thank you, thank you. Well, the second to the last question, uh, if you had a chance to do it all over again, what have you done differently? That's a very good question. Not much, because I'm so happy with my career and how things have turned out for me uh, that I, I think I took the right path. I guess there's two things that come to mind. One is I wish I had gotten more into the media side of the field earlier on. As I said at the beginning of our talk today, it's really design, the careful design of instruction that's crucial. But right. particularly nowadays with all the new media that are available, uh, having a good set of media skills uh, with, uh, particularly with regard to the computer and some of the new technologies coming, that are coming along is important as well. So I think I would have spent more time early in my career acquiring some of those skills and becoming more of an expert in that area. But again, please, uh, viewers, don't get so caught up with the media that you don't focus on what's really important, and that's being able to use systematic approaches to design good instruction instruction that will help students learn and that will motivate them. But that's one area. The second thing, and I've come to realize this in the past 10 years, because in the past 10 years, I've moved from becoming a faculty member to becoming an associate dean for research. So I work with young faculty, helping them find money, grant money to support their research. Those of you who are gonna go into business and industry, this isn't as an important skill, but for those of you who wanna go into academia, nowadays, uh, when you go into a university environment, particularly in the United States, but this may hold true in China as well, uh, mm -hmm. you need to find outside sources to support your research. If you want to do really significant research, it's right. hard to do it just using your salary um, and getting volunteers to help you. Getting grant money from foundations, right. from government agencies to support your work, will enable you to hire more graduate students, to pay research participants, to work over the summer on your research rather than having to run out and teach a couple more courses. And another thing it does, besides providing you with those types of resources, it, it requires you to come up with very good research ideas. Because you know, if you're a regular faculty member, you can do research on almost anything and someone will publish it. Whether that has an effect on anybody or anything is another question. I'm very happy that the research I did in my career was always very practically oriented. So I hope, and I think it has had some positive effects on real people in real world. Another area I did a lot of research on was on Sesame Street. And a matter of fact, when they had a 50th anniversary of Sesame Street, and they had a review of the various research articles that examined how to improve student learning from Sesame Street, two mm -hmm. of my articles on that topic were, were cited. So I'm very proud of that. But the but bottom line here is, when you go for grant money, they're not gonna say, oh yeah, we'll fund you for doing this little minuscule research, that means nothing. They're really looking for research that's gonna have an impact on real people in the real world. So I would strongly encourage those of you who wanna go the academic route 
to study under faculty members who already have grants. So if you came to Florida State, for example, I'd either have you study under Jim Klein or under the two people, or Vanessa Denon, or the two people who have a lot of grant because Jim and Vanessa are just great advisors and would be wonderful to study under. But uh, to work under people who are active in the grant seeking world, Funk Funk huh and Val Shoot are just phenomenal. They've had so many grants. And when you work for somebody who's been working on a grant, uh, you learn about what it takes to put together a big grant, to right. run a, a, grant propose, a grant project. So that was the other thing I wish I had done more of early in my career, uh, getting involved in doing grant work. Other than that, I've been so happy with my career. I wish that everyone who's watching this has as good a career, such a positive, look at this, I'm now in my early 70s and I'm enjoying my work so much, I don't have any intention to retire until they kick me out the door. I just love it so much. <laughs> <laughs> What's the plan? When that is do you want to want to retire? Me? Excuse when me. When do you want to retire? Like age eighty or ninety? Well, I wouldn't go to ninety. If, I, if I, I'd be a you know, if I'm another five years would put me at fifty years at Florida State. Then I'll maybe then I'll maybe figure I'll retire. But maybe I'll stay until I'm eighty. I don't know. I'll uh, wait my, for five years and come back. Yes, no, five years and then put on a few more years and make it to 80. I, I just like my work so much and I get so much positive reinforcement because I basically work one-on-one -on -one with young faculty and they always say to me, oh, Bob, thank you so much for helping me write my, art, write my grant proposal, help me find grant funds. It's just a delight. It's just a delight. And, and getting a chance to talk to you, George, is really a delight too. A viewers, you should be so proud that you're, of George because he's made so many connections with leading figures in the field and know so much about our field. I'm always amazed about George's breadth of knowledge. So I think those of you in China who was first learning about our field, you should all bow down, well not bow down, shake George's hand. Don't shake his hand during the pandemic. Wait until the pandemic is over, but give him an elbow bump or something because he's just a great, great leader. Thank you, thank you for your encouragement and uh, thank you, sir. Uh, last question, what do you, uh, what advice, because all of our viewers and uh, some of the advice we already, we already given, but uh, most of our viewers are young and still in the, on the rise to in their earlier, or earlier stages of, of their career. They're still on the rise. So what devices would you give to them? Wow, there's so many things. I know. I say, and a lot of it we've already covered. But you if bet. you're gonna pursue a career uh, where your goal is to get into the field of instructional design and technology, uh, the, the number one thing is don't ignore the instructional systems model. It, be mm -hmm. sure to focus on designing good instruction. Mm -hmm. Don't get so caught up in the media that you ignore the basic principles of good instructional design. And as I said very early on in this lecture, uh, those principles, in my point of view, can be uh, summarized as four basic things being clear about what it is you want your students to learn. What is it that you want your students or your clients, students to learn? Making sure that your instructional activities focus on giving them the information, practice and feedback they need to acquire those skills. And make sure it's motivating as well. So that's number two, good instruction. Motivating provides instruction, the information they need the practice and feedback they need, and not a whole lot of extraneous stuff. Right. Number three is assess them. It doesn't have to be a written test, but assess the learners, not only to see if they've acquired those skills, but also to see whether or not your instruction has been effective. Mm -hmm. if they, if, that's the third thing. And if they haven't acquired the skills, provide them with a mediation, like we talked about mastering, so they can acquire them. Right. And, and revise your instruction if they haven't acquired it. And that's the fourth thing. If they haven't acquired the skills, be sh don't put the blame on them. Go back, work a little harder, try to make that instruction better. I, I've been successful, but I still go back all the time and revise my instruction. I, I did that a half an hour before the presentation today because those 10 slides that I showed you, mm -hmm. they were part of a much larger set of slides. And I said, I'm walking, talking to this audience. They only need these pieces of information. I practice what I, I preach. I had about 40 slides and I said, which of these slides do I need for today? I came up with those 10, shared them with you. So again, practice those instructional design, learn those instructional design skills, use them. Uh, don't pass up good opportunities if you think you can do it. When you take on a task, be sure to do it well. 
communicate well, and you're going to be a wonderful instructional designer, and hopefully you'll have as wonderful a career as I've had. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for walking, also including uh, walking the talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And also on media, back, back you, er, earlier you said uh, we, we should focus on media, but not only on media. Uh, I, I, I learned a saying that, uh, you know, media, well, technology comes and goes, but principles and theory stay. Good. I like that very much. So the principles and theory of instructional design remains. Media comes and goes. Any of you who go back and read my chapter on the history of instructional media, which is right. in my book, and I also have articles in a couple of journals about that, we'll see that as new instructional media came along, everybody said, this is going to solve all the problems. First, there was instructional films in the early 1900s. In the 1920s, it was instructional radio. Radio, right. In the right. 1950s, it was instructional television. Each time a new medium comes, oh, this is the answer. But the answer isn't the medium. It's the instruction that is presented via the medium. It's the content. Right. Content is king. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Wow. I have, well, we have covered a lot of contents, but not even the corner, 1% uh, of what you have done uh, throughout your, prof uh, your professional life. But this is already a lot for us to absorb and to study. And, uh, and uh, this is really, really uh, inspirational talk. And uh, on behalf of all of the viewers, Bob, thank you. My hat off for you. Thank you, George. Very nice talking to you. And good luck to everybody in the audience. Bye-bye. And, uh, and, and stay safe. Oh, you too. You too. Very good. See Let's you keep now. In touch. Yep. I definitely, bye -bye. George, please. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Wow, that's really a long talk. That's a long interview. Uh, my interview with Dr. Bob Reeser lasted over two hours. And during our two hours, we talked a lot about ISD and IDT and why it's called, should be called IDT and his book, The Trends and Issues in Instructional Design and Technology. And he covers so many of them, so many of the topics and also how do we become a good instructional designer. And also we heard a lot of touching stories about Robert Ganey, Walter Dick, et cetera, and also Benjamin Bloom. And also we learned a lot about mastery learning. Benjamin Bloom's another contribution to this field. I believe following the footsteps of big giants we will grow faster. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for your over 50 years of contribution to this field. And thank you for all of your work. And thank you for talking to us for over two hours. Thank you again. Next week, we are going to have the very honor to have another heavyweight champion on our show. This person is very well known, or this professor is so well known in China. His name is almost synonym, it's almost synonym to a foreign professor in China. His name is Dr. Bill Roswell. Yes, William, Dr. William Roswell. Professor Ro Roswell is so well known to China. He's been to China I remember he told me over 80 times, over 80 times, 80 times, eight zero. And he has published over 100 books so far. And we'll ask him how many times and or how many books he has published and how many times he's been in China specifically in our interview. And uh, also he has many students in, across the globe, not only in China, and many of our students are very well known or famous in our field internationally. So in this, uh, in, in, in this episode, uh, in the ne next week, we're gonna ask him a lot of questions or basic questions, uh, basic definitions of our field. How do we define our field? Because there's so many definitions and concepts and, um, and, and, and uh, configurations in our field. We need to know, we need to clearly define it. 
and he is the right person to do it because he had been, his area of research and practice covers a wide range of topics, including how do we define human resources and human resources management and human resources development? What challenges is our field going to encounter in the future and how do we rise and cope with them, et cetera, et cetera. So until next week, still stay tuned, stay safe, and let's expect that next week we're going to have Dr. Bill Rothwell on our show. So I'll see you next Wednesday. Thank you and good night.